I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. You might need to squelch that just a little bit. This is our fifth annual multicultural business forum. Uh, we started this with an idea just to bring the community together and uh, bring our resource partners together and highlight some of our uh, our up some of our uh, partners uh, who can assist businesses in the region. <laughs> That's Mary, I love that. I love that about you, Mary. <laughs> she can whistle better than anyone. So we're delighted, delighted to be here in this wonderful space provided by our friends at the Fuller Craft Museum, uh, where they recently just celebrated their 50th anniversary. This building was built. Yeah. It's really such a wonderful space and a milestone, 50 years. Uh, I know the mayor and I were here with our wives uh, for their celebration, right in this room where there was a, a light and music show, really extraordinary evening. And uh, we're just so delighted to be back here and have use of this space. Um, I want to thank our host. Uh, Gwen Gavin's been on the ground here helping us get everything going, and it couldn't have happened without uh, Gwen. Gwen, Gwen. Gwen. And uh, Denise Labica, who's the uh, director here at uh, the Fuller Craft Museum. And our, our careers have gone back 30 years. We overlapped when she was at the uh, Plymouth Plantation, and I was at the Plymouth Chamber of Commerce. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Denise to come up and just uh, say welcome to you. Well, good evening, and welcome to our little gem of a museum here in the city of Brockton. Um, as you may know, uh, back in 2017, we rewrote our strategic plan, and one of the four initiatives was community engagement. And we've been working hard to really tie our museum in with all the great arts and culture planning that's happening in the city, and to really be a community partner. Um, we opened for free in July of 2019 for all Brockton residents. We have a great scholarship program happening for uh, Summer Spark for children, for youth of Brockton, um, sponsored by area businesses. So we really, we welcome you wholeheartedly to our, our, little, our little museum. And please, as Chris mentioned, we celebrated our 50th year last year, and we have a fabulous exhibition called Striking Gold. If you haven't had a chance to walk through it, Please do, because it's actually coming down in a couple of weeks. So this is sort of your last chance. Um, and and follow up uh, after that with um, a visit to our museum. We're introducing a really spectacular international partnership exhibition with a couple of folks in the UK celebrating uh, and commemorating the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Crossing. So we have. 10 artists that are featured interpreting what that story means to them, including Native American artists and artists from the UK and the Netherlands and the US. So please come back in May and visit us to see another crossing um, and enjoy the rest of the evening. We're so glad to have you here and please come back. Thank you so much, Denise. You know, it's funny, we were preparing for tonight, and with all of the talk about this uh, little virus that's going around, we, we were asked to put up signs and not shake hands, but this, this crowd and this community is, <laughs> we don't, we don't, we, we, we don't pay attention to rules, and we, we love networking, and, uh, and, and we like to uh, kind of just reach out and say hello, but we thought it was funny when we got here, we'll be giving this away later, by the way, if you have a business card, make sure you get it into the uh, basket, because you could win this, but we thought, what a, what a themed uh, event here. Uh, the Fuller's uh, tagline is, let the art touch you. We, we added, but nobody else. Don't let anybody else. <laughs> you know, struck us as funny. So you can win that later. Make sure you get your business card into the basket. So uh, Brockton is such a wonderfully diverse gateway city with a real rich history and a very bright future. Uh, in fact, Brockton's strength lies in its people and its diversity. Brockton's diversity today uh, is how the U.S. will look in 2050, 2060. So I feel like we're ahead of the curve, and many of us doing businesses uh, with, with each other in this community uh, see how, the, how, how to uh, interact and, and how to uh, integrate and how to move uh, your company forward and identify the strengths in, in uh, the diversity in a community like this. 
And speaking of the U.S., uh, we're happy um, to have with us U.S. Small Business Administrator for the Northeast, Wendell Davis, who's to my right. Uh, you're not going to speak yet. We're going to hear from you a while. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we're going to hear from him in a little, little while. We're delighted to have um, them also with us uh, with a host of federal and state resources here around the room and in the next room uh, next door. We had so many people who want to participate. We had to open up the room next door as well, give you a chance to kind of get in there and also look around uh, at the exhibits. Uh, the, the space is also where the dessert and coffee will be uh, later on. So uh, please take some time to visit uh, with the exhibitors here tonight. Uh, you never know where these relationships can lead and, uh, and, and can be a strength to your business going forward. In addition, we have some uh, partners who helped us uh, put this together, uh, and they've been with us for about five years, right from the beginning. We have the NAACP from Brockton. I know Phyllis is here, and Robert <laughs> Jenkins. Uh, we have the Cape Verde Association and the Haitian Community Partners, Old Colony Planning Council, Brockton Area Transit Authority, the Haitian Adult Day Care Center, and the Center for Women and Enterprise. So let's have a round of applause for them. We also couldn't do an event like this uh, for free unless we had partners like this. But in addition, someone's going to write the check. And we're so delighted to have Northeastern Savings Bank uh, step up and really pick up the cost uh, for tonight. So. We're going to hear from uh, Rich Spencer, pre their president, uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, but also with him are Jeff Chanel and the whole team here from uh, Northeastern Savings Bank. So. Uh, we want to thank Lady C&J Foods. If you haven't tried it, it's out of this world. Uh, Cynthia and James, all right, fantastic. BC Tet and Awning, Bob Coster's back here again. He lets us uh, have all this, uh, these great tables and chairs and everything. Uh, Peppercorns Cafe providing the desserts, uh, as well as Montilio's. And of course, Rich uh, Morgan Photography. So, a round of applause for all of them. In addition, we have some elected and appointed officials with us today. My understanding is that Shirley Asak, uh, City Council President, is here, as well as Rita Mendez. We're going to hear from her in a little while. Uh, Jack Lally, I understand, is here. Uh, Jeff Thompson is uh, here, on his way. Tim Sullivan from the Rockland School Committee. Uh, Mike Brady, our Senator. Yay! Tony Branch from Southeastern Regional Vocational School. Uh, Rob May, our City Planner. And, uh, of course, our Mayor, who you're going to hear from in a minute. So, uh, in addition, I wanted to ask. Okay, three, uh, the, the, the House delegation is doing business in the state house today. That's right. They're not playing hooky. So, the, the, every now and then, this time of year, the House and the Senate end up in late hours. So, we, we did get the word that our House of Representatives uh, is in session till midnight tonight, trying to grapple with some budget issues. I think it's positive, right? Because the yeah. budget's doing pretty well. Uh, but they're trying to figure out how to spend it. So, that's, that's good. I did want to uh, mention also uh, Margaret LaForest and Susan Whitaker, who are also with the Mass Office of Business Development, who have joined the staff this year and are here to assist businesses. Uh, I think Nat Lee, who's been with us for many years, I, she might be on her way or is here. And um, we have Veronica Cavallo Martins, who's with the Cape Verdean Consulate General's Office. So it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce our MC for this evening, and uh, we got a great panel panel as uh, as well. But um, it's my pleasure to introduce our past recipient uh, of the Athena Award, which is presented annually to a woman who not only projects leaderships but also encourages leaderships and enables leadership in women in business. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the new executive director of the Old Colony Planning Council, uh, Mary Waldron. <laughs> So, hello everyone. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I did this last, this was my third year emceeing the event and I usually takes me a couple times to do this. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Ah, oh, that is awesome. This is terrific. So first, Chris, thank you. Um, it really truly is my honor to be here emceeing. I cannot see without my glasses, and as I get older, they get stronger, so um, they need to be on. I'm also about a foot shorter than Chris, so they did offer me a little step stool, and I denied it, because I figured I can go on my tippy toes here. As the women on this panel, you will see, do not need any high heels. They are all above um, us all here. So Metro South is a rich tapestry of diverse people and cultures all of who contribute to the strength of our region. As a resident of Brockton, 
and the region. I cannot imagine living here without such conveniences, such as access to so many flavors, the arts, the culture. I actually do my Christmas shopping right up above and have a piece of artwork from the Fuller Craft Museum. What a pleasure it is to emcee this event um, and have hosted it here, um, and to have it hosted here in the Center of Art, Craft, and Culture, the Fuller Craft Museum. As a member um, and also the director of OCPC, I get to see and help plan the future of rural, suburban, urban landscapes. I view the diversity within the region as a competitive advantage. It's a beautiful advantage, and I see it every day. I look out my window, I look at my neighbors, I look at the school system, and it's a beautiful advantage. At OCPC and Metro South Chamber, we strive to cultivate diverse leadership and to facilitate minority business growth. It's to engage the diverse community to impact that will have an effect on the region and beyond. Tonight, we will hear from several small business owners and community leaders who have realized their dream, sought education, refined skill set, and have achieved success. And it is important to realize they didn't do it alone. I've had a chance to talk with a number of them before, and the stories are beautiful stories. Through, through resources, organization, mentors, and networks available to you all, they have achieved success and benefited so many. We hope you listen and listen well to their brief stories and become inspired to move closer to your dreams of starting and growing a business. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to introduce a very important member of our city. Brockton is so fortunate to have a mayor who understands the importance of small business and the strength that comes with the diversity of thoughts and actions. I call him my friend. I am lucky and to have been honored to have voted for him. Please join me in welcoming Mayor of the City of Brockton, Mayor Bob Sullivan. Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to the City of Champions, the City of Brockton. I also want to welcome you to the uh, Fuller Craft uh, Museum, not just recognizing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but nationwide. We are in a gym right here. I encourage you strongly after we, uh, you know, socialize and we listen to the fine speakers, please take the opportunity and the time to walk around and see the artwork and the crafts. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chris Cooney and his team from the chamber. I want to thank the board of directors that make up the chamber. I want to thank the MC, my dear friend Mary Waldron and OCPC and Jimmy Pereira back there and all that are doing the Main Street Corridor. But I personally want to just thank each and every one of you that are coming here tonight. You don't have to be here tonight, but you understand the importance of working together in a collaborative approach to better the community called the City of Brockton. I'm just fortunate to be the mayor of the City of Brockton. It's, it's a business, a $440 million business, and it's the people business. And I'm really proud of the fact that we're uh, changing a new day in the City of Brockton, right? I said this this morning when we were at an event for Olvera's, um, Brockton is poised for greatness. I've said this many, many times. Uh, the number one asset are the people of the city of Brockton. And we welcome everybody to please shop here, work here, live here. It really is a great, great place. It really, really is. You know, if you think about it, we have three commuter stops, jump on the train, get into South Station, 35 minutes. People are moving here to the city of Brockton because the price point and Dorchester, Charlestown, Southie, Quincy, Braintree, it's just too much. But they're coming here, and we welcome them, we encourage them, keep coming. With open arms, we're going to embrace you. But I also want to say, take the opportunity tonight to pass business cards, trade emails, trade cell phones, do everything. That's what the 5th Annual Multicultural Business Forum is all about, right? It's coming together, sharing best practices, sharing business strategies, and forming coalitions and collaborative approaches. So again, Listen to these folks, they're, they're professionals, they have a story to tell. My dear friend, Councilor Lodge Rita Mendez, this is great, and I just want to thank you for being here, and I look forward to next year on the 6th Annual. God bless you all, thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, you can understand why this city is gonna be moving itself, continue to move itself forward, so thank you. 
Now I'd like to introduce the Regional Administrator for SBA Region 1, Wendell Davis. We are delighted he is able to join us this evening. Davis oversees SBA's financial, export, disaster relief, government, contracting, and business development programs for the six New England states. In addition, he coordinates a network of small business technical assistant partners that are funded by the SBA with counselors and mentors housed in 31 small business development centers, 26 SCORE chapters, nine women business centers, and a veterans business outreach center. <laughs> and I thought I was busy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming U.S. Small Business Administrator, Wendell Davis. Thank you, Mary, for that introduction. Bob, Bob's the district director for Massachusetts. Stand right if you raise your hand. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have Bob on board. Boston's the Massachusetts district office is one of the top performing district offices in the country. And you guys are all blessed to have Bob and his staff. They've been incredible. You know, Mary, I think I need you at all of my functions. You can bring a room to the attention. I mean, they, everybody wants to listen when you, when you talk. That's a cool thing. You know, thank you for that introduction and good afternoon. I guess we're into the evening now. You know, it's a, a distinct honor to be here tonight, and you know, I'm truly excited to talk about, you know, and engage in a conversation, a discussion, if you will, about how we collaboratively, we together, you know, with the, the Metro South Chamber, the SBA, and all of our resource partners, and all the folks in this room, you know, ways that we can help catalyze and energize, and if need be, revitalize the small business community and ecosystem, you know, in the Brockton area. You know, it's an, it's an important discussion. It's an important conversation. And before I begin, you know, I, I want to thank, you know, we wouldn't be here today, this afternoon, uh, if it weren't for Chris and Chris's leadership, your vision, your passion, most importantly. And I was going to ask for a round of applause, but you guys, you guys knew where I was going with that. You know, Chris, in, in the Metro South Chamber, you know, your, your, your leadership and your efforts you know, it's really critical in this area and it's greatly appreciated. You know, over the course of the past two years, two plus years now, I've had this incredible privilege of rep representing the Small Business Administration throughout New England. And in my travels throughout New England, I've met with countless small business owners. And one of the things that I recognized early on and something that's become abundantly clear is that we've gone from an economy where, where folks are saying, where's the work? You know, I need more work to survive, to one where business owners are now saying, we're the workers. You know, I got the work, I need the workers. And that's the number one issue as I travel throughout New England that I hear. You know, we're, we're in an economy that economists call a full employment economy. You know, it's something that we as a nation, we haven't experienced in a long, long time. You know, we haven't experienced this type of unemployment at such a low rate since we first put a man on the moon back in the 1960s. You know, I'm a numbers guy, and when I hear numbers, I like to break them down and try to figure them out, but just this last January, our jobs number came out with 250,000 uh, plus jobs that were, our economy created. And that far outpaced all predictions and prognosticators and all the experts. But this was what was kind of interesting. Even though we created this robust number of 250,000 jobs, the the unemployment rate actually ticked up. It went from 3.5% to 3.6%, which is a historic number to start with. And when you look at that, that's in part because another number that came out with the Department of Labor was that over 300,000 people got off the sidelines and they came back into the workforce and looking for a job. You know, these are folks that had all but given up looking for a job and here they are back in the workforce. And that's a really cool thing. And as Larry Kudlow, the chief economic advisor for, for the White House, as he noted, you know, there's an estimated additional 2 million plus people that are still out there on the sidelines, you know, that we need to reach. There are over 6 million jobs out there that remain unfilled. You know, that's an amazing number. You know, that's a historic number. And when you think about these types of numbers, you know, I think opportunity, and we all should be thinking opportunity, all of us here today, we collectively, here tonight have a unique opportunity to reach deep into our historically underemployed communities. 
you know, right now, right here, arguably before us, are opportunities that have never existed before ever in the history of our nation. You know, un unemployment for folks without a college degree, historic lows. African American, Hispanic American, Asian American, unemployment, historic lows. Veteran unemployment, historic lows, the list goes on and on. You know, opportunity. You know, we can reach, we have an opportunity here to reach deep into these communities and help more and more people. You know, I read this great statistic that was in the Washington Post back in the fall. Of the 6.3 million jobs that have been created under this presidency, 4.5 million of those jobs have gone to minorities. I mean, how cool is that? That's a really cool statistic. You know, Lou Holtz, the former football coach for the University of Notre Dame, he used to often say, after all is said and done, oftentimes more is said than done. And I'm acutely aware that as we live in these what I call hyper-rhetorical times, a lot is said, a lot is tweeted, but with respect to the national economy, you know, the results are real. The results are impressive, and the results are impactful. You know, Another really cool stat underscoring this. The American Express has annually been publishing uh, this study that they're doing, the study of women-owned businesses in America. And what they found, and, and this is really cool, women of color, while they represent 39% of the total female population in the United States, accounted for, this is an amazing number, 30, they represent 39% of the total female population. They accounted for over 89% of the net new owned businesses opened up last year by women. And that's an amazing number. And this is under macro historic numbers. Over the last two years, so just last year, women opened up on average 1,625 new businesses each and every day for the entire year. That was a record number and an amazing number. This is a quote from the study. Women are starting tech companies with the potential of scaling to become unicorns, companies with a billion dollar market valuation, opening up local storefronts, joining the gig economy, and everything in between. Women are killing it in this economy. That's my quote. It's a little bit more blunt, but uh, not as glamorous. And guess who's leading the charge? Where'd Mary go? We're gonna put Mary, we're gonna put you on the spot since you're talking to my district director. Mary, guess who's leading the charge? We're going to put you right on the spot. She's like, the charge of what? <laughs> Chris, any ideas who's leading the charge on, on this incredible number? African American women are leading the charge. They represent 42% of the net new women owned businesses, which is three times the share of the female population that they enjoy. That's an amazing number. Latina Hispanic women own businesses. 31% uh, of all net new women owned businesses are Latin, Latina and Hispanic. That's roughly double the share of their female population. You know, John F. Kennedy used to talk about how a rising tide lifts all boats. And in many ways, that's what we're experiencing today on a national level with all of the, the incredible economic news out there. You know, the American dream, owning your own business, you know, that's, that's that next level. You know, this notion of the American dream, you know, it, it, it goes back to our founding fathers. You know, it's part of our collective national DNA. Alexis de Tocqueville was a French historian back in the early 1800s. You know, here you have a French historian looking on the outside inward at a fledgling America, and he recognized, hey, there's something unique about this. There's something special going on. And he used to, re he referred to the American dream, and I love this quote, and I quote it all over the place. He referred to the dream, the American dream as the, this is the quote, the charm of anticipated success. What a wonderful expression, what a prescient observation. You know, when I speak at events like this and when, when I meet with our SBA partners, when I think about what the role of the SBA and, and all of the SBA partners like SCORE and SBDC and, and our WBCs, our Women's Business Centers, our VBOX and our CDCs and our micro lenders, you know, when you distill our collective roles to its essence, you know, we exist to reach as many people as we can to introduce them to this notion of the American dream of owning your own business. You know, I love talking about the jobs numbers and the, and the good economic news. You know, it's the first step in raising expectations and raising hope. You know, Martin Luther King used to talk about the dignity of labor. 
you know, job puts food on the table. It allows a parent to model the importance of a strong work ethic. It, over time, hopefully, hopefully allows us to save a little bit. And a steady job, hopefully, allows us to dream a little bit like many of you have here in this room. This is the thing, though. You know, why we're here today, you know, why we're all here together. You know, a job, higher pay, job opportunities, those are all good things. But I know I want more, and I know you folks in this room want more. You know, owning your own business, it does all of those great things that a job does. But it does one more critically important thing. You can't pass a job down to your children, your family, your own business, however. You can pass that down. That's legacy building. You know, that's wealth creation. That's building wealth for you, not only yourself, but for your family and your children. That's being an active participant in the American dream. And the SBA is here today with Bob and, and Chris with the Chamber of Commerce and all you folks and the resource partners because we recognize that we have this awesome responsibility and obligation to help you realize your individual version of the American dream, whatever that may be. Let me close with this because I know I'm running along. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I could go on forever talking about this subject. Let me just end with a quote from the late Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, which I've modified a bit because I think it, it really speaks to this notion of entrepreneurship. There are no great limits to entrepreneurship and innovation because there are no limits to the human will and human intelligence. There are low, no limits to our collective imaginations. And there are no limits to our capacity to wonder. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody in this room. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Wendell. Having no limits. I think that's the message that we all are going to be hearing about from our panelists. Tonight's business panel is sponsored by Northeastern Savings Bank. Northeastern Savings Bank mission was to build on an, a simple idea. Local people and their businesses are best served by a local bank with local interest at heart. Northeastern Savings Bank is a true community bank. I'm gonna ask for everybody's attention if I could. This is, thank you. It's a community bank with both personal and business services. Whether you are looking for your first mortgage, starting a business, or saving for the future, you will get down to earth personal service from a, fi a financially focused team. More than a century later, established in 1864, they are still a mutual institution with a big heart. Please join me in welcoming Rich Spencer, President and CEO. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Mary. Um, tough act to follow, clearly, from all the statistics and everything else and uh, the mayor's presentation. Um, so I'll keep this short and sweet. Uh, certainly, thank you to Chris and his team here at the Chamber putting on such a great event. Uh, it takes a lot of effort when you do these type of events and just a tremendous job by you and your team. Uh, it's fantastic. The venue's fantastic. What a beautiful place. And we're happy to be here as well. Um, Northeast and Savings Bank is honored to have the opportunity to sponsor this. Um, today we have a panel, fantastic panel. Uh, we've had great speakers. And also, there's just an amazing amount of resources, whether it's a bank or other resources that you're seeing there with the SBA, uh, city officials and folks around. You know, take advantage of that. These are great opportunities for you to have those opportunities to speak to those individuals. You know, I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, for us, I thank the team that we have here. Thank you for taking time out of your night to come and, and uh, be here tonight as well. Uh, any questions you have on the finance side, they can certainly answer them. Um, I won't be able to. I know they can. Um, but the, this is really a truly great forum for you to really explore and harness your ideas and share them amongst each other. Um, so a little bit real quick, uh, I'm not actually from the area, I'm actually uh, from a small town in Vermont. Um, growth and prosperity in my hometown is certainly bleak. Um, having been down in the South Shore now over 20 years and now rooted in this community as well, um, there's a lot of growth and prosperity in the and the opportunities here are really, truly endless. Um, I mean, we have literally local restaurants that are getting national notoriety. Uh, we have market-based rent 
apartments in the center of the city now that are going up. And it's just a really, really, as the mayor said, it's just an exciting time to be part of this community. At Northeastern Savings Bank, uh, we've been the bank behind the curtain of many of these and other successful ventures. And I personally take pride in the work that we have done here at the bank. Whether your ideas are small or big, look around the room and know that you are not alone. These folks are also committed to reach their goals and work together as a community to prosper. As the mayor kind of alluded, and I feel like we took notes together, um, our community, this community, will prosper when you shop local, when you eat local, and you bank local. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Local, 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 local. It, it just does not get better than that. Thank you, Rich. It's now my pleasure to introduce the business panel. panel. Oop, but I'm going to do a couple of things first. So two things. Here's my rules. I'm going to go run out there and tell everybody at the bar to say, shh, because we really want to hear them. Um, and number two, we're going to start doing some drum rolls. So hold on. The team of the chamber really put a lot of work into this, and our panelists deserve all of our attention. You don't want me to be whistling into this mic, it will blow your ears out. Um, but I do want to be able to have the attention. But with that note, <clears throat> with that note um, the bar and coffee and refreshments are going to be out there, so hang on. It's all going to be worth it. <clears throat> so. Um, I'm now going to introduce, now to get the form of the panelists, who will share their interesting and inspirational business stories. Please welcome to the stage, Sabrina Victor, Miss Massachusetts, USA 2020. Rita Mendez of Mendez Law Group. Kelly Mallory of Mallory Headsets and Carol Chin, a leading McDonald's franchise owner and entrepreneur. No, 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 let's give it up. Look at these ladies. All right, hang on, we're gonna do one more thing. Now we're ready to go. I'm just going to have ladies, as you get a chance, just to get up on the chairs. I know. I would have needed a little step ladder to do that. So once you get yourself settled, what a beautiful looking panel. Seriously, this is going to be incredible. So first on the panel to tell her story is Sabrina Victor. So I know Sabrina from Bridgewater State University and um, had the pleasure of meeting her and working with her. She proudly serves as Miss Massachusetts USA 2020. She is a performance activist. Yes, please give it up again. There can be lots of... Um... She's a performance activist, passionate about sharing diverse stories through all art forms. Hailing from Brockton, Massachusetts. <laughs> Sabrina graduated from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, receiving two undergraduate degrees in theater and journalism, a multicultural theater certificate, and Commonwealth Honors. She currently works in higher education as a recruitment assistant at Bridgewater State University, where she facilitates all part-time hiring for the institution. Note that she coordinates all part-time employment for the university, so keep that in mind. In her spare time, she is a professional actress in the Boston area with local and regional theaters. Her credited work includes award-winning American Repertory Theater, Speakeasy Stage, and Company One, all companies dedicated to new and diverse works. Sabrina serves as a mentor and member of the creative direction team with the Brockton High School Fine Arts Program. As a Haitian American, Sabrina believes in the importance of inclusive, inclusivity and diversity in all aspects of life, and wants to continue inspiring young girls and boys to chase their dreams. This is her first speaking 
in front of right, a big group like this. So let's give her a warm welcome, Sabrina. Hello, everyone. Woo. They can do better than that. Hello, everyone. Hi, this is fun and going first, so wish me luck. Um, <laughs> I am so honored to be here representing the state of Massachusetts, and I received my title on January 12th, 2020, so uh, it's still fresh. It's been such a whirlwind, but I'm just honored for the opportunity to represent not only Massachusetts, but to represent the city of Brockton and to represent the Haitian community as well. Um, and I want to note that I was crowned 10 years after the devastating earthquake that happened in Haiti on January 12th, 2010. Um, so that was a really important moment for me. I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, it speaks to just how we can continue pushing forward. You know, a lot of people lost family in that earthquake, including myself. Um, and I just always want to represent for my culture. So thank you. Um, what's my business, you might ask? My business is my personal brand, being Miss Massachusetts USA 2020 and also being a performance activist. So before I dive into that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as Mary already mentioned, I'm Sabrina. I'm 23 years old. Yes, so uh, I. some might say I'm young. People still call me kiddo at work. <laughs> it's hard to get used to, but um, I am surrounded by so many uh, talented, wise people who are always giving me great ideas on how to grow and how to learn, um, especially working at Bridgewater with people like Mary. So happy to see you here. Um, I identify as a woman of color, but I exist in multiple spaces. Um, I have so many different identities. I think we all here can relate to that. But I am grateful for the opportunity to um, highlight women and highlight minorities and be on this panel with amazing, beautiful women. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm currently living here in Brockton, Massachusetts. And this is my home base. It's where I call home. I've lived here for more than half of my life, although I'm also from Florida. I was born in Miami, some might say little Haiti. Um, but Brockton is a big home of mine, and I think there is so much diversity here, so much cultural diversity, uh, so much talent here that's brewing as well, and I want to speak to that talent and see how we can further elevate other people's voices, just as my voice is elevated through this title. So, my personal brand as my business. I like to call myself a performance activist. Now, this has a lot of different definitions, but I like to use it in regards to creative expression. So you might hear me use that term a lot or explain to people that I am a performance activist, and don't worry, I'm gonna break it down for you because I know at first glance, it might sound like a mouthful, a long title, but it's important to denote the word activist. I am a performer but I'm also an activist in the same right. So performance activism draws from the humanities and social sciences, including anthropology, performance studies, and performative psychology. So it draws directly upon our capacity to play, to create, um, and to learn from one another. And I think that we can use performance in all different aspects, all different forms, to speak to social issues happening in our community, in our society, global and local. And I say all aspects, meaning theater, acting, dance, song, music, writing. How can we encourage each other to use those avenues to be activists in our own ways? So I like to say this plays into my personal brand because as an actor, it's a mission of mine to participate in productions that speak to important social issues happening. So like Mary mentioned, I've worked with a lot of different theater companies in the local Boston area, um, and all of them have missions that are dedicated to sharing diverse stories, which is why when I was in college, I got a multicultural theater certificate. So we got to learn more about theater uh, in a diverse sense and looking at diverse playwrights, diverse plays, um, how to tell social issues through sharing a story, through a script, through a play. And I think it has been such an important reason 
about why I call myself a performance activist. If I had just studied theater, I wouldn't have been open to the, all the things, my eyes wouldn't have been open to all the things that I've learned through that avenue. Um, and I think that social media plays a big part in my brand. How I am able to reach different audiences. I have a, brand, a, a large group of followers that follow me. Uh, personally as Sabrina, but also now as Miss Massachusetts USA. So it's a great platform that I have and I'm able to reach so many different people and share with them my story and my ideas. And my goal is to serve as representation for other women of color, especially those who want to pursue a career possibly in the entertainment industry um, and help them find their voice in different avenues and how they can do that. Because you know, my thing is acting, but. That might not be anybody else's thing. Is anybody else in here into performance in any type of way? Woo, one hand in the back. <laughs> Give you an air high five back there. <laughs> um, but I think it's specifically important to speak to our youth. So our youth, they are going to be the next generations, the next leaders of this place. So how can we speak to their power, right? Right now, they lack economic power and social power because, you know, these are kids. They're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're growing, but we need to instill in them the tools that they need so they can be successful in the future. So I focus primarily on arts education um, as one of my platforms because I think it's important that we speak to marginalized communities that don't have access to the arts, places that you know, have never experienced school plays and don't know what it's like to go see plays, don't know what it's like to experience arts and culture in an enriching form. So I think that Brockton has so much beautiful talent here. There's so many great kids in the program that I volunteer at back at Brockton High School. I was an alum. Um, 2014, I graduated from Brockton High. I know a lot of people here have probably graduated from there as well. Raise your hands if you're a Brockton alum. Brockton High, so many. Shout out, Brockton Boxers for life. Um, and going back to the school and seeing these kids just having the time of their lives, learning who they are as artists and learning if it's what they want to do. Some of them see it as a hobby and they really just you know, enjoy having that time away and being able to explore who they are. But some people really take it seriously and choose to build a career out of it, kind of like how I did. And being an actor has enabled me in so many other ways. It's allowed me to be here speaking in front of you. Um, you know, I'm a little nervous, but I think that I'm just, you know, staying grounded in the fact that you are all here for the same reason, because you want to learn something new. I want to learn something new too. I want to learn something from all these beautiful women here. Um, so I really want to express that that is a big part of my personal brand as a business. So how can I grow into this business of reaching out to other people in my community? And how can I use the resources available here today to do that? So as you know, I'm pretty fresh Miss Mass, only two months I've been in this position. Um, so I really want to learn about the different organizations that are available here, the different resources, and how I can tap into that, and how we can benefit um, from working with each other. Um, and I did do a story with the Enterprise uh, about my recent win, and it was a way for the community to learn about who I was and what I'm passionate about. And I think that advertisement is a really important resource that we need to think about. How are we sharing the things that we do? How are these businesses getting out into the community? How is the community learning about these different businesses? You know, We wanna stay local. We wanna feed into the city so we can continue building revenue for the city so we can provide funding for the schools and our arts programs. Um, so I, again, would encourage you all to make sure you check out all of the businesses, get their information, sign up for their newsletters. Um, I plan to do that as well. I was running around, I got here, and there were so many people taking pictures with me, so thank you very much, I'm flattered. Um, so I'm definitely going to connect with everyone once this is over. Um, and I would attribute my recent success to social media and word of mouth. So I think that each connection leads to a new one and now I have resources expanding outside of Massachusetts. So I wanna talk about how we can you know, expand outside of the local 
the local geographic area that we are in while still supporting each other? How can we expand our businesses so that we are reaching bigger markets, bigger audiences? Um, as a social media influencer, I might say, not necessarily an influencer, but some people might consider me that, I'm trying to learn about how I can access bigger markets. Uh, just recently, I did a social feature with Primark, um, and it's going to drop on International Women's Day, which is exciting. That's coming up Sunday, March 8th. Um, and that's a way that I can reach a bigger market and they can learn about my story and vice versa. My followers can then follow Primark. Um, and I was really happy that they were dedicated to sharing my story. They were really interested in what I do as a performance activist and what I, um, the things that I care about regarding diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think that the creation of your brand, it starts now. This is the advice that I would give to someone else who is trying to figure out how to use themselves as their personal tool. How do we build professional development um, off of the, the talents that we have and the skills that we have? I don't necessarily have you know, a building. I don't have you know, a product that I'm selling, um, but I would say that my personal brand is my business. And people can find me through social media. My, the main sites that I use are Facebook and Instagram, and I also have a personal website. So I'm able to connect with people through that way and build new relationships. And I think that it's important to note that there's so much talent budding here in this city, and they're interested in doing these things as well. They're interested in sharing their talent. You know, there's lots of artists out there and musicians, and I want to figure out how we can elevate their voices, share their stories, and how we can encourage them to use the resources in the city, because a lot of people like to go outside of Brockton, but we want to stay in Brockton, right? Because there's so much great resources here available at our disposal, disposal and we just don't know it. You know, there's a lot of organizations here that I um, haven't seen before, and I'm happy to make that new connection, but I really think it's important that we encourage our younger generation to start making those connections now as well. So, so Sabrina, you'll be around, I think, for a 23-year-old to be so inspirational, and I think our our world is gonna be a better place because of people like you, so thank you. So thank you. Thank you. So next we have Rita Mendez of Mendez Law Group and Brockton City Councilor at Large. With a thriving law practice, real estate agency, and electronics business, Rita Mendez has become a leading Brazilian American attorney on the South Shore. Fluent in Portuguese and Spanish, she has led the way for many of our citizens to become homeowners. As a trilingual attorney focusing on both civil and criminal litigation, she is fast becoming a go-to person for m many who have immigration, criminal, divorce, and custody issues in Brockton area. Rita Mendez received her Juris Doctorate degree from New England Law, Boston, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. And in 2019, she ran for Brockton City Council at large seat. She was sworn into office in January 2020 at, as the first Brazilian American to hold office in Brockton. Rita, please provide your comments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I am so happy and honored to be here today um, and see so many of you. And I, I made the effort to go around and introduce myself and see all the businesses. And it's so nice. And I really think that we should always do more of this. And uh, this is how we grow our business, just getting out there, getting the word out, and getting to know people. So yes, as introduced by Mary, so my name is Rita Mendez, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got here today and why I'm here today, because um, she read a little bit about my biography, and as you hear that, uh, a lot of people, they see the success in your life, but they don't really see the steps you went through in life, what you went through to get there. Because a lot of people, they go through the same struggles and maybe they're not strong enough to keep pushing, keep going forward to get there. So tonight, if you don't get anything else out of this um, panel here tonight, I really want you to 
uh, here and to know from what Sabrina said and from what I'm going to say and from what the other two ladies here are going to say is never give up, keep pushing because it hasn't been easy and it's not going to be easy and it can't be easy because then it's not fun. <laughs> it has to be hard. So anyways, I, um, I came to this country when I was 12 years old and when I first arrived I didn't speak a word of English and I grew up in a single family household, my mom. She was a single mother, she had to take care of three kids, so she was working you know, full-time jobs, two, three different jobs, so I never really had uh, much parent in my life. I never really grew up with my dad, so I don't really know much or anything about him. So, um, and not only that, when I was 16 years old, there were some things that happened back home in Brazil that my mom, she had to move permanently um, to Brazil, and she wanted to take me with her. But then we had a very um, hard conversation because I was honest with her and I said, I, I'm here in school and now I finally learned English and I'm in high school and I'm doing well. I want to go to education. I want to achieve my American dream. If I go back to Brazil, it's, I don't know what's going to happen there because I don't belong there anymore. I really want to be here and I want to make a difference and I want to do something in this country. So it's fine. I know you have to go. Go and I'll be fine on my own. So I did that. I was on my own at 16, um, not really having a place to live. So I was kind of going from place to place. I was in high school, um, going to school in the morning until 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and having to close the Dunkin' Donuts until midnight and being at school at 7 o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, you name it. Just trying to do everything in life to survive. But I knew it was going to be worth and I knew it was going to be paid off. And one thing I want to tell you is when you're going through some moments in your life, always know that like God is watching over you and taking care of you and is going to put someone beside you to really help you through. And I say that because when I was in Brockton High School, I had my guidance counselor, who was also my Spanish teacher, that knew my story. She was the only one, and she basically almost adopted me. And she really put me through high school, and she helped me get to Massasoit, get in scholarship, so I continue my education. And then when I graduated from Massasoit with the associate's degree in 2008, I had gone into the real estate, so I was a real estate agent. And I was doing lots of sales, and I was the salesperson of the year at the company, and I thought, you know, life was good, and now that I was rich, and doing all tons of clothing, because I didn't have any money before, so to me, I was rich. <laughs> and then I didn't continue my education, I just did my two years degree, and uh, everything was well until 2008 came, right? We all remember the foreclosure epidemic and what happened in real estate. So I was a victim of that. I lost my home, foreclosure, and it all started all over again. I said, oh my God, but we're gonna keep on pushing forward. If we fall down, we get up and we push forward. We don't give up. So I was like, okay, so maybe I have to go back to school and get a real education, a real career, a real degree, so we can push forward. So when times of crisis come, at least I have something to fall back on. So I did that. I went back to school, going to school at night. At that time, I was already married, being a mom, so life was much harder, but we kept on going. So I went to UMass Dartmouth, graduated there, went to law school, um, and I graduated from law school in 2017. I passed the bar the first time and um, became an attorney. <laughs> So, and then I had, I was working as a paralegal with attorney Jack Breeden. So when I got the law, law license, he was like, why don't you just start your own practice here? We'll help you get started. So right off from high uh, law school, I just started my own law practice. And how I built that law practice was I started volunteering my time at a, a community center because I believe that once you give your time, then it comes back to you naturally. So I was just over there volunteering and that helped me grow my practice and build up my practice. So now I have a real estate um, practice and I am an immigration attorney. And not only speaking about that, if life is not already busy, after I graduated from law school, did all that, then um, 2019 came. And then the attorney at the office said, oh, you should run for city council. I said, really? <laughs> I've never done anything in politics. You know, I, I go vote, but I'm not really that. I don't know, because I'm busy. I don't really have time. Oh, you're going to be a great city councilor. I said, OK, sure, I'll run for office. <laughs> not knowing how big that city was, how 
big of a challenge was, but life is full of challenge, right? When you take it, you own it, and then you go to, to, to the fullest. So I did that. I knocked on every door I could possibly think. I met people. I went to every single event. I just, you know, just started going out there and really putting the word out, and I actually got elected as city councilor. So I am um, councilor at large now in Boston. <laughs> So what I want to tell you tonight is no matter what happens, just keep pushing forward. It will come through, and there's always going to be someone beside you that is going to help you, that is going to walk you through life, and never give up, and your business it will grow, it will succeed, just by giving back to your community, to the people, and it just comes naturally back to you. So I really thank you for the opportunity. Amazing. So perseverance is certainly the word that is associated with Rita. She came knocking on my door on a 92 degree day with a smile on and her sign that says, I'm, I'm a mom, not a politician. How awesome is that? So thank you. Thank you. So next we have Kelly Ballery. Owner of Mallory Headsets is a telecom company that specializes in headsets, phones, VoIP, am I saying that right? Yeah. V-O-I-P? VoIP. Thank you. <laughs> Voice up right. Thank you. Um, and all telecom per peripherals in business for 23 years. She doesn't look like she's even been for 23 years. 23 I'm years. old. <laughs> they cater to all, they, she caters to all B2B and have a large portfolio of small, medium, and very large accounts. Kelly has local ties to both Brockton and West Bridgewater, and we will learn more very soon. So Kelly, if you can just provide us some overview. Hi everybody, I'm nervous as can be. I just want you to know right now, I really have no notes, I kind of just jotted stuff down. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'm Kelly Mallory, I own Mallory Headsets. I've had my business for 23 years. I Everything that these ladies have said is so true. It's so much work all the time. People go, oh, you're rich, you had your business 23 years. No, I work very hard every day, I still do it. 10, 12 hours a day I work, um, but I love what I do, okay? How I started my business is I actually had a really great high paying job at a telecom headset company. I was 19 years old, I wasn't fortunate enough to, I did want to be an attorney, but cards didn't fall that way. What I did was I made pretend I knew how to do books. And I got this job at this telecom headset company. I was 19 and just talked to my way in and had no idea what a debit was or a credit or <laughs> liabilities or any of that stuff. But I just won it and I would go home and read a book. I would literally go home. They would tell me stuff I had to do and I would say, yep, I'll get that done. And then I would go home and I, internet did not exist by the way. I would have to read a book. Okay, so I muddled my way through it and I got very good at it. I worked there eight years. Um, I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore because even though I was making money, at that time I was 26, I thought, I'm never going to grow in this company, right? But I know what I'll do. I had a baby at one point when I was there, like year seven, and I asked if we could hire a part-time bookkeeper while I was out on maternity. When I came back, she was so good, you guys. She went to Aquinas, this building was in Quincy, and she was so good at it, I said, we should keep her. And what I'll do is, my 10 hours, I'll give her, and I'll drum up leads for the salespeople. I never sold anything. And I knew the product, because I worked there seven years. And the owner said, yeah, that sounds good. And what happened was, I ended up selling more in those 10 hours than the salespeople that were there 40. So that's how I got into sales. Um, eight years in, I decided, I'm probably not gonna be able to grow in this, this company, so I'm gonna, apply for a sales position in a company doing what I was doing in New York. I'll be an outside rep. That's what I did. I literally, I called on a Monday. They said, can you come down for an interview Thursday? I said, yes. I called in Thursday sick. I went for the day. I got <laughs> hired and I gave my notice on Friday. I mean, it was simple, right? So I, um, so I worked at home for them. Um, I did make a lot of money. I made a very small base but I made a great commission, okay? But what I was finding was this company, I worked there three years, but I was finding that they were 
just not giving me credit for some of my sales. You know how it is. And I realized they're on the verge of going out of business. Oh my gosh, they're on the verge of going out of business. Oh, FYI, I just bought a house that I've had for like two weeks. So uh, my husband and I, and I said to my husband, this is gonna sound crazy. And I know, like, you're not, I hope you believe me on this, but I'm gonna start my own headset company. And of course, all my friends, and, and other than my mom, all my friends and my family, my mom and my husband said, you do it. I said, I know I can make it. I, I did the books, I sell a bunch of stuff. I totally understand how this all works. Why can't I just do this? Ooh, how are you gonna get money? Well, how do I need money? I have good credit. I'll set up terms with all of these, and this is a good thing to know, you guys. If you wanna sell a tangible product and you don't have money, you don't always need money. You need good credit, okay? You go to those distributors and those manufacturers and you set yourselves up on terms, okay? You say, I wanna be a partner. I wanna be um, a distributor from you. You're a manufacturer. They'll give you good pricing. Then you make phone calls and you go on sales calls and you may pretend you've got a gigantic warehouse and 3,000 employees, <laughs> okay? Because I'd be sitting in my breezeway getting big fat orders and they'd say, well, how many do you have in stock? And I'd say, 5,820. I have nothing, okay? <laughs> The person I'm gonna buy from has 5,820. So that is a good way to start a business if you don't have money, I mean, okay? Um, people don't think that, but if you really are you know, driven to do something, and I know I didn't want to be a boss. I didn't want someone to be my boss. I had two small children. My end game was never to be rich. It was to pay for college. Because as I said, I wanted to be an attorney. That was never gonna happen in my world. But you know what I could do? I could make sure that it happened in my children's world. That is my motivation, okay? And, you know, it is very challenging having, having your own business. But one thing I always say is, you know, I have employees. Sometimes I specifically want an older person to do a job at my company. Because I know, okay, you know, I know they have good work ethic. They're smart. Um, just because somebody's retired, I mean, my God, you, you can't stop learning. You, and it's not, it doesn't even have to be somebody older you learn from. I also have 29-year-old employees that know way more than me, okay? And one of the things that I think makes a person successful is knowing what you don't know. Because guess what? Nobody knows everything. And you never stop learning. You're gonna learn when you're 80, 90, 100. And those 25-year-old kids have a lot to teach us, mm -hmm. and so do those 80-year-olds. And so do we to others. So you will always be successful if you know you don't know everything. I have very shortcomings. I'm terrible at marketing. Uh, social media, huh? Um, but I have somebody that works for me that knows more than I do in that, those fields, and I utilize him. That's what it's all about, right? Um, so that's... I mean, I, that's really my story. I have nothing special. I just work very hard. And my, my tip to you guys, oh, I do want to say one thing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so, so sure, Chamber, I really appreciate it. Um, and as I walk through, I realized I want New York Life to be one of my accounts. I have Eastern Bank, and I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> You know, and I, when I started my business, I actually did go. And let me just throw this out there one more time. The internet did not exist, okay? Didn't even exist. I remember getting my website and going, why do I get to pay for this? No one, you, no one even has this. Ping, ding, 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 ding. You guys know what I'm talking about, did you? You know, the, the dial up, right? But I did go to score. I don't know how, I can't remember, because it's been 24 years, how I knew about score. But I knew about it, and I got my way to Boston. And I went into SCORE, and I sat down and I spoke to, I went in and it was like a bunch of older people, because remember, I was 27. And I sat with a man who, I told him what I wanted to do, and he really showed me a little bit, helped, helped me out, told me, gave me ideas and different things that I could do to begin, and I never forgot that. Okay, and when I did incorporate and really start my business, which I started out in my home, 
My husband said, you gotta get out, because we can't, you know, this is getting crazy. I rented a space on Belmont Street for short money. It was like $300 a month, and it was three rooms, and I thought I was so cool. And then I bought my own building. So, you know, it's just, you just never know. You just gotta work hard. But everybody here, when I look around, I was AD certified, okay? It was awesome. But you gotta remember, when you get all these certifications, obviously I'm still, you know, MBE, WBE, I'm still that. But when you get your eight, eight A certifications and you really use the state, and utilize the state for all the things they have to offer, like Combi's, which is like a website that you can go on once you have your certifications and you, you can look and see if anybody's looking to buy the products or the services that you're selling. It's really great, but you have to remember something. Nobody is going to buy from you because you're a woman, because you're of color, they, they're gonna let you put your foot in the door and maybe let you do a presentation or bid on products or be included in their RF, RFQs, but you still have to, you still gotta bring the service. Um, the honesty, the integrity, the good pricing, all of those things you have to have or you won't make it. It's just simple. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm not more prepared because, see I wrote my little notes right here while everybody was talking about. <laughs> Um, you know, that's it. That's just Thanks. really my tip to everybody is just, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but hard work does pay off. And know what you don't know, because that's what makes an intelligent person, not somebody who has an IQ of 160. Somebody who really recognizes where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are, and they know where to get the answers for their weaknesses. And you work hard. You will make it. Okay? So that's it. Thank you so much. Know what you don't know, uh, and 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 what, notes or no notes. If we, this is a, this is the kind of advice I think that we all can um, appreciate. So thank you, Kelly. Finally, we have Carol Chin, McDonald's franchise owner and entrepreneur. Carol immigrated from Hong Kong to New York City, where she earned a B.S. in accounting from Long Island University. She ran an accounting department with New York Board of Education prior to deciding to open, up, open her own business and start a career with McDonald's. Today, Chin owns multiple McDonald's franchises in the Boston Brockton area. As an owner operator, Chin works on people development and marketing, including creating local store promotional marketing for a senior, for a senior demographic. She takes pride in working with a bilingual staff to be sure to cater to all types of guests and best serve her community. Chin's success has enabled her to give back as she is involved with the community and schools. Chin is grateful for the opportunities she's found in America. Quote, you have to work hard no matter what career path you take, end quote. Work hard, gain knowledge, go learn whatever you like. There's a lot of training programs in the area that people can take advantage of. With that, I'd like to introduce Carol Chin. Good evening, everyone. Um, slight correction on my bio. I was born in Hong Kong, uh, migrated to South America, Caracas, Venezuela, when I was 11 years old. So I do speak fluent Spanish. Wow. Yes, um, then I wanted to come to America to pursue the American dream. So I came here when I was 17. And you talk about learning language, don't have any money, <laughs> overcome many challenges. Um, worked in a sewing factory with my aunt, um, piecemeal. Boy, so employees that come to me and say, Boss, I work so hard. I said, you don't know what working hard is. Mm -hmm. When you're working in a sewing factory with 100 women and two fans, it was brutal in the summer months. But anyway, uh, so early years, early on, I learned to persevere, have a vision, and my goal was someday to get married and have a nice family and own my own business. So upon graduation from college, I met my husband, Vern, he's standing over there. 
Director of Operations, Francisco over there, thank you. So, um, so fast back after almost 30 years in business, um, I attribute our success on three principles, actually four, from our founders. Ray Kroc, he founded McDonald's franchise in 1955. So in 65 years old business, and we managed to stay number one. Mm. It's based wow. on four principles, quality, Q, S, C, and B. So quality, serve great hot fresh foods, service, fast, fast service with a smile, and modern decor, stay contemporary. And um, B, value. So everyday affordable value for the community and clean restaurant. So then we employ over 400 employees for our seven locations. And I always, always talk to people. You hire people for attitude and you train for skills, okay? Once you hire great employees, you can train them to be a great hospitality, to take care of your customer, or to serve a great hamburger. So, and we have experts in, uh, in our business to maintain equipment, so our equipment perform. Um, we have operation people, so Francisco helped me with that, and my husband run the operation side. And um, we almost always hire within the community, and we promote and train within the uh, within our pool of employees. And we always have opportunity to promote and grow. And um, our new growth, as your business, like Ray Kroc always say, when you are green, you are growing. So now we grow our business through Uber Eats, Grubhub, mm -hmm. and DoorDash. Mm -hmm. So, so many of us working women, we bring the food to you, which is a great convenience. We are constantly innovating, um, upgrading our facility, and you all are welcome to come to my grand reopening in 715 Belmont Street on March 23rd at 10 a.m. Please come and join us. And we also have digital apps so people can place order ahead of time and you just pull in and pick up your order. Uh, we have a tandem drive through system now. We can take two cars order at a time, so it's much faster service. And anyway, we are always innovating and keeping up with the time so we can stay number one, hopefully. <laughs> so um, I want to thank my husband, Vern, here, my son, Andrew, my director, Francisco, for joining me, and as well as mayor, councillor, and especially Chris from Chamber of Commerce. You do great work for Brockton, and it's, we've been here 15 plus years. It's been a great experience doing business here. So my advice to young entrepreneur, like Miss Massachusetts, so in order to succeed in any, anything in life, so first, love what you do, okay? Love what you do every day. Network, learn from each other and work hard and have the persistence to overcome challenges. Connect with your customers, provide the best service and value in your marketplace, and you would have the opportunity to succeed and fulfill the American dream. Thank you very much.
That is amazing advice. Um, and I want to personally thank you because as a working mom and when my daughter was going through school, I spent way a lot of money over at the McDonald's <laughs> to help me. And, and, and again, as you said, innovative and it's now healthier and it's all wonderful. So Carol, thank you for the beautiful words of wisdom and also um, the history of how you came here. So thank you. Um, so thank you to Carol and all of the panelists. Um, thank you. At this time, there were names that were drawn. So the drawing for the uh, door prizes are um, for the bottle of kava is Marlene Mendez of Victory Human Services. Is Marlene here? Awesome. Um, another bottle of kava is Kelly Forrester of Brockton Area Transit. The bottle of kava is Margaret LaForest of MOBD. We all have to get over to Mass Office of Business Development. The Fuller Craft shirt and bag with Plymouth 400 hat is Melissa Rideout of Set Point um, RX Holbrook Braintree. So, thank you. We hope, in fact, I'm not even saying we're hope. I know that you are inspired by their stories and feel empowered to pursue the opportunities created through this evening's program. We encourage you to think about starting and growing your business locally. We have to show up on March 23rd at 10 o'clock in Belmont Street. <laughs> Whatever it might be, we are here to help you and expand your network. Please stick around um, for the Business After Hours and challenge yourself to meet 10 new people. You really, I think it's a great challenge. You never know what, where that might lead um, in terms of new opportunities. There is coffee and dessert. Don't, don't go on me yet. Coffee and dessert in the next room. And, um, the cafe and and the course of the cash bar that is remains open. Thank you again to our sponsors, premier sponsors, Northeastern Savings Bank. Hang on, I will whistle. I promise you. Our main sponsors. It really is important. Northeastern Savings Bank, our facility sponsor, the beautiful Fuller Craft Museum, Food Partner, Lady C and J Soul Foods, Peppercorns Cafe and Catering, Montilli Montilio's Bakery. Supporting sponsors, Mass Office of Business Development, BC Tentanani, all of our partners and exhibitors tonight, Rich Morgan of Rich Morgan Photography, Boss Brockton Community Access, and a shout out to Athena behind the camera, um, and, and the Enterprise News, our Chamber Ambassadors, and all of you for attending. Just a reminder, special edition of Good Morning Metro South will be a lunch on Friday, March 27th at Massasoit, and um, please see Lexi to register. Also, the Chamber's annual taste of Metro South. This is a biggie. Annual taste, the annual Chamber's taste of Metro South is on April 29th at the Greek Orthodox Church right next door. Over 40 restaurants showcasing their multicultural flavors of the region will be serving their specialties. Great music is arranged with Brockton Jazz Band, Breakaway Band, and several talented musicians. Please see Lexi, Chamber Program Director for Tickets, or to sign up as a restaurant. This concludes our business panel portion, and have a great weekend. <laughs>